afternoon session. We have uh, one more and then the open forum. And uh, before we uh, begin this session and before I introduce the speaker, I'm going to ask uh, Doug Hott to lead us in a, a song and then J.D. Conley will lead us in a prayer and then I'll introduce B.J. Number 73, Mighty Fortress, number 73. A mighty fortress is our God, a Lord ever daily. Our helper, he of it above, our mortal ills prevailing. For still our nation foe does seem to work. Almighty Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are our fortress. We're thankful for this lectureship that has fortified our faith in thee and in your Son, the Christ. We pray, dear Father, that we'll be more effective servants in thy vineyard, more productive in thy service. We're so thankful for the honor it is to be your children and the privilege and the hope that it gives us. And we pray, dear Father, that as we live out our lives here upon thy footstool, that we'll always remember to glorify your name in our conduct and in our walk of life. We're thankful for Brother Clark and for his ability, for his love of your word, and may we listen attentively to the things that he has prepared to deliver to us. May we apply them to our lives and equip us for heaven. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Like several of the speakers that have uh, shared with us this week, um, I've known them for a long time. And I've known BJ for a long time. We went to college together. And uh, we're glad that he's able to be with us today. And um, you'll be uh, happy as well uh, once you hear the lesson. B.J. was born in Canton, Illinois, and he earned his B.A. and M.A. from Fried Hardeman University. Um, he's preached for churches in Tennessee, Arkansas, and uh, Mississippi. He does a lot of work with GBN. I'm sure you've seen him on uh, the Gospel Broadcasting Network does a lot of speaking at lectureships and events uh, throughout our brotherhood. And um, he and his wife, Tish, have three children. Uh, his daughter's here uh, today with him. We're glad to have her. And um, we're glad that he has come. Uh, I could say a lot about him, but probably one of the better things I could say about him is that he's a Steelers fan. And uh, that uh, I can appreciate that very much. Um, we have had this session this week to be uh, discussing things that stunt the growth of the church. And we've talked about some topics such as apathy, conflict, uh, fatigue, 
And uh, BJ's lesson is on the topic of intimidation. And so I hope you'll grab your Bible and join in with us as we begin this period of study. Thanks. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you and to be a part of this great effort. I really appreciate uh, the good work that's being done here at this church and this school. Glad to be partners in preparation of men to preach the gospel and uh, do not consider ourselves to be in competition any more than lighthouses do, as we often say. And so we're grateful to be here and to be a part of this. And I'm so thankful to God for the good work that's already been done here today. I've profited just from driving over. I can honestly say this, if I left and had never delivered this message, uh, I would have profited from the study it took me to put it together but I would have profited just from the sermons that I've heard today. Preachers need to be preached to, and we don't often get that chance. And so this was a real privilege for me to be able to hear these marvelous lessons. Can you imagine hating good news? Can you imagine hating good news? These individuals, these Jewish authorities in Acts chapter 4 hated the good news that was being heralded by Peter and John and the other apostles. And uh, they couldn't produce the dead body of Jesus to stop this resurrection preaching that was going on. And you know, if they could have, they would have, they would have wheeled the body right down the streets of Jerusalem and said, here is your risen Savior. And that would have put Christianity to death in its cradle. But they couldn't do that. And so in the absence of information to the contrary, to say that Jesus had not risen from the dead, they tried intimidation instead. And when the information is not on your side, it's very easy to try the intimidation method instead. And so if you'll begin with me in Acts chapter 4, you will observe that in verse number 7 they call the apostles on the carpet, so to speak, and they want to know this. In Acts 4 and verse number 7, here's the question that they asked. By what power or by what name have you done this? Have you done what? The reference is back to what they did in Acts chapter 3 when they healed a lame man, a man that had been in that condition for 40 years. And we know that uh, this was something that had caused a great deal of uh, people to turn their heads and to consider Christianity and that which would be called Christianity later on at least. And so you think about uh, this business that we're reading about in Acts 4 and they want to know by whose authority are you doing what you're doing. We know we didn't authorize you to do this. You remember that Jesus had said before he ascended into heaven, all authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore... And I was taught when you see the word therefore in the Bible to stop and see what it's there for. And in view of the fact that I have authority delegated to me from heaven above, I'm commanding you apostles to go therefore and preach the gospel to every creature, make disciples of all the nations, Matthew's account says, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That's exactly what Peter and John are doing here in Acts 4. And so they had divine authority to do what they were doing. And you'll remember Peter in verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus had said they would be. He said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. This is almost like saying your honor. It is a term of respect even though it does not denote agree agreement. And I think one of the things that I learned is that even when people try to intimidate us, that does not necessitate our reacting right from the get-go in a harsh, abrasive, and threatening manner. You can stand up for what the Bible says and say everything that it says and not have to get ugly. And that's exactly what we read about here in Acts chapter 4. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and he says, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel... If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he's made whole, 
Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Now did you notice already that respecting them does not mean compromising with them? He has said to them in a very strong term of respect, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. But then very clearly he says, you crucified the Christ. Yes, you did. Does he not know that's going to get him in potential hot water with these authorities? He goes on to say in verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you, builders, which has become the head of the corner. You rejected him, and yet, look, God has made him the head of the corner, and there's not salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, the, if there was an attempt to intimidate, to put timidity in to Peter and John, it hasn't worked so far. As a matter of fact, my study and assignment is to really take what happens beginning in verse 13 and going several verses down and showing you the reaction of the, uh, the people to this and the Jewish authorities to this. As you think about what we see, I want you to consider what these Jewish authorities saw. Look at verse 13. What did they see? Two things. One, they saw the, the boldness of Peter and John. Brother Guy mentioned this in his excellent presentation a few moments ago. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. And yet they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They were not educated. The Greek word idiotes. We use the term much in a less flattering way. Back then it, it meant they're unskilled, they're untrained. And so how could these unskilled, untrained individuals be standing there with such a degree of boldness? So they were impressed by the boldness of these apostles. But I want you to notice they saw something else. After taking knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus, watch verse 14. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them. This man is standing right there in the, it's exhibit A for the veracity of the work of the apostles. Remember, confirming the word with signs following. Jesus had said in Mark 16 and verse 20. And so here the apostles showing that they really are credible spokesmen from God and that their message is indeed heaven sent. And so the authorities see this. They see the boldness of Peter and John. They see the man who had been healed standing, and they know that there's nothing they can really say. So I want you to consider next what they could not say. Look at what they could not say. In verse 15, but when, or verse 14 rather, beholding the man which was healed standing with them, watch this phrase, they could say nothing against it. It was not going to work for them to try to deny that this man had been healed. He had been, well, look at verse 22. The man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And don't you think the people in the community knew who this man was? Don't you think they knew about his condition? You can't very well deny that he's been healed when you see him jumping and leaping in chapter 3 and you see him standing here in chapter 4 and there's no way to deny that a great miracle has been done. So they can't say anything against uh, the miraculous power of the apostles. They don't have the truth on their side, yet that's a real lesson for you and me. If you'll watch what's going on in the news today, when they get on these news shows and they start debating some moral issue, they can't say anything that is going to trump the truth of this book right here. They cannot say anything that would make this untrue. And so they don't even really try to engage in reasonable argumentation. They try to engage in intimidation instead to try to put timidity into the spokesman to get them to hush on the basis of that's unloving. They don't say it's untrue. That's unloving. That's not fair. That's arrogant. That's narrow-minded. That's bigoted. They try all kinds of tactics to try to get us to hush. 
And yet they don't deny, they cannot deny the truth of what's being said sometimes. On this occasion, they could say nothing against the miracle that had been done. I want you to also notice in the next place what they did say. What they said among themselves at least. Look at verse 16. Saying, what shall we do to these men? Now notice in verse 15, they'd commanded Peter and John to go out so they could have a little private talk. And they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them. It's clear, it's manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. Now you'd like to think they were, the next words out of their mouth would be, so maybe we ought to become believers in Jesus Christ. They're admitting the truthfulness of what just happened with the miracle. The veracity of the apostles is not in question in their mind. We can't deny that a notable miracle has been done. But what they, what they say among themselves is essentially, how do we spin this to where it does not, verse 17, spread further among the people? That was their greatest fear, that this is going to spread further among the people. Now, I want to ask you a question right now. Do you and I have any good news today for the world? Yes. And yet, how is Christianity being painted by its critics as narrow-minded, unloving, bigoted? Friends, that's not a fair representation of what Christianity is. And it's not a fair thing for them to act like the apostles' whole mission was to upset people. The apostles had blessed people's lives both physically and spiritually by this miracle that had been done. And yet the Sanhedrin, they're so focused on themselves, these Jewish authorities, they cannot see past how this affects them. And so what a damning admission on their part. We cannot deny it, but we're going to. This reminds me of the two farmers, and I don't know why you'd even care about something like this. Uh, I read about two farmers that were having this discussion. One of them said, I've got more rats in my barn than you've got in yours. No, no. I've got more rats in my barn than you've got in yours, sir. All right, well, let's, i tell you what we'll do. We'll go to my barn, and we'll take a pitchfork, and we'll start jabbing at bales of hay, and we'll start making a big commotion, and you just stand outside my barn and watch how many rats come running out. And he came, and they did all the commotion, and here came the rats running out, and the farmer said, well, that's, I will admit, that is a lot of rats, but you haven't seen my barn yet. You come to my barn, and I'll do the same thing, and the rats will go running, and you'll see that I have even more than you do. And they made all the commotion, and we came, the rats were running everywhere. I mean, they were, there were probably more, but the man that was supposed to be watching had his eyes sh as shut as tightly as possible and said, I didn't see a single one. And this reminds me of the mentality of some of the folks in the world in which we live today. You and I try to show them what God says, and they say, I didn't see it. Well, why didn't you see it? A young lady I baptized when I lived in the Knoxville area got excited about what she'd learned, and she went to her sister, and she said, I want you to, I want you to see what I learned today. I found out you can be a member of the Lord's church without joining any man-made church. I found out this about salvation and how you can just worship God the same way they worshiped in the first century and have an organized church the same way they were organized in the first century. She was so excited and her sister said this emphatically to her. She said, I will not study with you. I am afraid of what I might learn. Didn't Peter talk about some who are willingly ignorant? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. And friends, there are some today who are willingly ignorant of the truth. They don't want to see it. But there's some out there who just need to see it and we have to be the ones to take it to them. We can't be intimidated into backing down just because someone else has gotten upset. Look, our, our students do some door knocking and I know that it's not the number one successful method of evangelism. 
that exist in the world today and that there are better, maybe more successful percentage-wise methods of evangelism. My view is use all the methods of evangelism that you have at your disposal. And I'll tell you one reason why I'm still a little partial to this one, even though I know we live in a different world in some ways. Uh, There was a door knocking many, many years ago now in the St. Louis, Missouri area. And they left a flyer on a particular door and the family wasn't home. They came back home and found the flyer on their door and said, you know, we've been talking about the need to get in church, to get these children in church with us. And here's a church that cared enough to come right to our door. And even though we were out and about when they were here, they cared enough to come to our house. Let's try this place. The next day they went to that location and they were having a gospel meeting They attended every service of the meeting. They set up a Bible study with the preacher and uh, were baptized into Christ and later sent their twin daughters to Freed Hardeman where I married one of them and Kirk Sam's a preacher in North Carolina married the other one. I don't know whether it was a male or a female or a young couple or an older couple or a teenager that put that flyer on that door that day, I'll tell you, I'm so grateful to God that they did, I would like to hug their neck. But we're a lot of times intimidated by these door-to-door. Did you hear about the couple that showed up for Monday night visitation And they were very nervous. They'd never had to make a visit like this before. And lo and behold, they drew the card to go and visit a wayward member. Can't we just visit a shut-in and say a nice prayer and come right back? No, you need to go visit this wayward member. And they were very, very full of trepidation about it. And the preacher said, you know, I find that when I'm nervous and afraid and scared, I just pray and everything works out just so well. Why don't you go off in this room over here and pray about it before you make your visit? And they said, we'll do that. And they did. They came back home and they were all smiles from making their visit. They came back and the preacher said, see, isn't prayer amazing? And they said, yes, it is. We prayed they wouldn't be home and they weren't. (laughs) I don't think that's quite the message the preacher was trying to leave with them. But we're intimidated by confrontations. We cannot be, as long as we have the right spirit and the right attitude and a commitment to truth and a love for souls, we cannot allow intimidation to keep us from saying what has to be said to try to save someone's soul. And we need to look at it a little more dramatically than we do, I think. we're, We're trying to snatch men out of the fire, the book of Jude tells us, verse 21, If a snake was curled up outside of one of these doors and it was poised to strike and I saw that you were walking right near it, do you think I would say to you, "Um, could I speak with you for a moment, please? There is a snake and he is about to strike your leg and I just wanted to have a little brief conversation with you about it. What would I do? In that situation with the the stakes that high, look out, look out. Get your attention as quickly as I can because the stakes are high. And we need to come to terms with the fact that there are souls who are headed for a devil's hell. And we have to lovingly confront them and tell them the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, even when they don't like it. And that's what Peter and John are able to do with the Sanhedrin, with the Council of the Jewish Authorities here in Acts 4 and 5. I want to show you something here. The plan, of course, is to intimidate them into silence. But look at what Peter and John said in response to being told not to say anything at all. In Acts chapter 4 and, and verse 19, after they'd been, verse 18, called and commanded not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now, interestingly, isn't it? They don't say, hey, you can preach Jesus as long as you don't preach this resurrection stuff. They were smart enough to know you can't really preach Jesus without preaching his death, burial, and resurrection. They knew that was going to come out of the mouths of the apostles if they preached on him. And so they said, it's best you don't even mention his name. Don't teach in the name of Jesus at all. 
But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you be the judge of that. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So wait a minute, you're not going to back down after our threat? No, we can't. Now there's a movie right now showing at the box office called God is Not Dead 2. And though I would not in any way, shape, or form give a wholesale endorsement of the content of this movie and some of the things that are taught about how to be saved and things of that nature, the thing that is frightening about the film is that it does show more and more of an antagonism that is growing in our culture toward anything that's perceived to be Christianity. In fact, the very end of the movie cites as the credits are rolling case after case after case, after legal case that has brought the script together in that movie. It is a, it's really a conglomeration of a lot of different issues that are going on. And uh, the basic premise of the film is that a girl asks a question in class, asking about something Jesus said about being peace-loving. The teacher responds, yes, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus did say that and acknowledges that such was said by Jesus, whereupon she is immediately reported by one of the students, and there is a suspension, and then a court case. And I'm telling you, as you watch this unfold, the thing that's frightening to me is that there are some individuals who will just hush. She had a chance to either apologize and say, I won't mention Jesus anymore, ever, even if a student asks me a question that would warrant such a mention, I won't mention him anymore, and I'll keep getting my paycheck, keep getting my paycheck, keep getting my paycheck. She knew that by making this decision, she was not going to be getting a paycheck, and life was not going to be coming up roses. And I thought to myself, as as hard as that would be to lose your job, I want to ask you a question. Is there anything any harder than what we read in verse 21 and what we continue to read in chapter 5? So when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding nothing how they might punish them, but not because they didn't want to punish them. At this point in time, the people's attitude was still too supportive of the apostles and their work. And, I mean, after all, look what they're doing. This is wonderful. But, you know, as time goes by, the authorities get more and more desperate. And when you get into Acts chapter 5, they call them back and said, didn't we straightly, verse 28, didn't we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine." And intend to bring this man's blood upon us? And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And what if the authorities in a certain town say, We want your sermon transcripts such as they tried to do in Houston. And they want to check to see if you've been criticizing homosexuality from the public platform And uh, what are you going to do then? What if the government sends down an edict that says you are not allowed to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 in a worship service? You're not allowed to even read the words of the inspired Apostle Paul. We can't exhume his body and put him on trial. And so if you say the same words that he wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, you're going to jail. Now, am I trying to be dramatic when I say that something like that could be looming on the horizon? Is that far-fetched, yes or no? Sadly, it's not far-fetched, is it? So what are you going to do, preacher? Will you come visit me in prison? I'll come visit you. I cannot be intimidated into changing God's marriage law simply because that's what the Supreme Court has suddenly decided they have the authority to. And some will try to intimidate you by saying this is the law of the land as if that trumps the law of God. Friends, 
You cannot be intimidated by that now any more than they were then. What was the law of the land that they were being told to follow? Quit preaching Jesus. What was the law of God? Go preach Jesus to all creatures. And they had to obey God rather than men. And they couldn't back down. And they didn't back down. Can can I ask you what happened to them that changed them? Isn't this the same group about which we read in Mark 14, 50? They all did what? They all forsook him and fled. Now, when they're threatened, they won't back down. In fact, it got to the point where later in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. Wait a minute, what shame? Verse 40. When they'd called the apostles and beaten them, They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That's what they told them in chapter 4, but they went out and did it anyway. Well, now they've added a beating to the mix. Maybe this beating will get you to slow down next time and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. But what happened in verse number 42? Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And can you and I do any differently? Look, we need to keep preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. I've always been amazed at the Apostle Paul and what happened to him there in his missionary journeys. And they stoned him and left him for dead. And you'd almost expect to read. And the next day, the Apostle Paul retired from ministry. But you don't read that. You read him later saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 11... That he had been cruci- that he had been persecuted. That is, in so many ways. In fact, in Second Corinthians eleven and verse number twenty-four, the Jews five times he said, five times I received forty stripes save one. Question: How many beatings would it take to intimidate you into hushing up? How many? And I'm asking that question starting behind me and coming forward. It's easy to be brave in the pulpit when the people listening to you are the folks that generally speaking would agree with you. But what if there are officers standing out in the lobby just waiting? Are you going to back it down a notch then because of what might happen to you? The Apostle Paul was beaten five times, 40 stripes save one each time. Okay, that's bad, but verse 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. How many rod beatings would you have to experience before you said, okay, no more? Once was I stoned. How many stones would have to be thrown at you and me to get us to hush about what the Bible says about this subject or that subject? We've already got some folks who are telling us Look, just don't say it publicly. And it breaks my heart to know one church that built a large and magnificent building, called their preacher in, and they said, look, from now on, any teaching you do about the subject of marriage and divorce and remarriage needs to be done in your study, not from the pulpit. We cannot afford to have people leave this place. Preacher, would you be intimidated by a decree even from the eldership that says don't preach on this biblical subject ever in public? And I'm not talking about being rabble rousers and going in and uh, just immediately trying to upset the apple cart and this, that, and the other. I remember the first Sunday I preached in South Haven, Mississippi. This fellow made a beeline for me. He said, well, I want to know one thing. When are you going to preach on smoking? It was my first Sunday there. I said, I tell you what, let me get to know the brethren. Love them, hold their hands at their surgery, go to their kids' ball games, uh, preach the word day in and day out, week in and week out, get to know them, love them, pray with them, and then I'll preach on anything the Bible says eventually, but I'm not going to start off by going in this direction. Jesus said, I have many things yet to say to you, but you're not able to bear them now. John 16 and verse, but there comes a time when people have to get to the point where they can receive it. And we've got to teach it even when we know that some people don't like it. I've got a book that I, someone might recommend that I read called How to Make It as a Preacher. J.J. Turner wrote it. 
in the back of it are 100 real life situations that have happened to preachers in their preaching life. One of them always amused me. And my roommate Brian Gisabaugh and Freed Hardeman used to read these scenarios to each other and say, well, what would you do if this happened at the local church where you preach? One of them said this, while you were preaching, a member sticks her tongue out at you. You know what? I think I could handle that compared to what I've just read here. We get so, so neurotic about criticism sometimes, and I think, I don't know who formulated the curriculums at some of our schools of preaching, but I think there's tremendous wisdom, at least in the way ours is arranged. The last quarter, the last quarter of study uh, that someone has, if they start in the regular first quarter in the fall, the last quarter of study includes a study of the book of Jeremiah. You talk about a man that went through some things, and yet, he, oh yes, he got discouraged. I'm, I'm just going to hush. I'm, I'm not going to say anything. He says, I couldn't keep it in. There was a fire in my bones and it had to be said. And friends, you see these apostles, they can't keep it in. They love the truth. They love the souls of men and they know that the truth they're preaching has to be preached. And if you want to know what changed them, as I close out, look at Acts 4 and verse 20. The last phrase of verse 20 is really what it's all about. What changed them? Watch. The things which we have seen and heard. The night they ran, Mark 14, 50, that they all forsook him and fled. Think about what happened after that night. They saw Jesus crucified. But then after he was buried and put in a tomb and they thought they were done with him, the authorities did. Here he came on the first day of the week and the apostles saw him on more than one occasion. They had seen the risen Lord and then they saw him after teaching them and strengthening them for about 40 days about the kingdom of God and how with much tribulation we have to enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22 teaches us they were able to see Jesus ascend into heaven and know that he was going there to be at the right hand of the Father on high. And knowing that our Lord is both risen and ascended and exalted gave them the courage to stand up to whatever wrath the temple hierarchy wanted to bring their way, and they would not back down. If things get worse in this country, and God forbid that they do, but if they do, we're going to need to do what they did after they were let go, and even before persecution comes our way. We're going to need this. We're going to need each other. Look at verse 23 of Acts 4. Being let go, they went to their own company, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them, Acts 4, 23. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice and started praying to God. Prayer is powerful, and we need to pray fervently and ask for even more boldness as they did in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Listen, no matter what the threat is, do we still need to speak with boldness the word about the plan of salvation? Do we still need to speak with boldness the truth about homosexuality and Islam? And on and on I could go. We've got to preach the truth, the whole truth. Well, you can't grow a church doing that. That will turn people off, will it? Some, yes, it will. But let me ask you, do you remember what happens in the chapters following this? Acts 5, also right in the midst of that chapter, Ananias and Sapphira are put to death like that for something they did that they needed to learn a lesson about. And the rest of the church needed to learn a lesson about this. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And then the next thing you know, verse 14, believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Do you know, someone made this statement some years ago, and I've always remembered it, said, you know, the problem with Christians today, nobody wants to kill them anymore. Well, that made me think, i do I get up in the morning and go out and try to turn people again? No. <laughs> Brother Rod Rutherford is here. 
I remember being in his class in auditing one of his classes when he taught years ago here. I, I remember him telling about a statement someone made. That man is so Christ-like no one dislikes him. Well, let's stop and analyze that for a moment. That man is so Christ-like no one dislikes him. Did anyone dislike Jesus Christ? Enough to kill him. Enough to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. It's not a popularity contest. I've got a message of hope I'd like to end with. Does God love you any less than he loved Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Who? I think it's unfortunate that they're better known by their Babylonian slave names. I think if they had a choice, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah would rather be known as that than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Babylonian slave names. Whatever you call them, you call them courageous. They were not intimidated when they were told, hey, you bow down to this statue or you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And we're going to heat it up even hotter than normal. You can do what you want. Our God is able to deliver us if he wants to. You do what you want, but we're not going to bow. They wouldn't bend. They wouldn't burn. We've often preached that outline. And so God doesn't love us any less than he loved them. Does he love you any less than he loved Daniel? Who wouldn't back down. He wasn't intimidated by the decree that says you can't pray. He just kept on praying. Uh, Did he say, well, I tell you what, I'll just go undercover with my prayer. He opened the windows just like he had before. He wasn't about to change. And they threw him in a lion's den, and if he died, that would have been fine with him. He would have died as a martyr, but doing the right thing. And God saved him, spared him. Our God is able to bless us with increase even in times of hostility. We need to go out and lovingly preach this word Humbly preach this word as was noted the last hour. Respectfully preach it. But we do not need to be intimidated as long as we're preaching of thus saith the Lord. That's what this world needs.